I'm Noah Kowalski, and on behalf of my colleagues here at Invariant, I'm pleased to welcome you to our sixth Dialogue for Change. Dialogue for Change is Invariant's series focusing on critical conversations about racial injustice and inequality and the actions we can take to influence change in the public and private sectors. Through our series, we ask what can CEOs, employees, and individuals do to enact change? Today, our distinguished speakers, each of them prominent activists, will discuss their expectations for corporate participation in social justice reforms in the Black Lives Matter movement. I am humbled to be hosting today's discussion as activism is a deeply personal issue to me. I grew up in a family where activism was a norm. Some of my earliest memories were marching with my mother, a public defender, and father, a Unitarian Universalist minister for marriage equality at a time when don't ask, don't tell was the law of the land. I learned to speak out on racial inequalities, especially as an adopted Korean American growing up in a state, Vermont, with a 97% white population. Activism is an incredibly powerful tool, and I'm excited to learn from today's panelists. Thank you all for joining the discussion. In appreciation for their participation, Invariant will be making contributions to their favorite charities, Power Rising, New Pride Agenda, and Translash Media. I'm now pleased to introduce our panelists. Amara Jones is the creator of Translash Media and the first journalist in residence at WNYC's The Green Space, where she hosts the monthly program, Lives at Stake, and is the host of the Translash podcast. Rashad Robinson is the president of Color of Change. He was a member of the inaugural cohort of Atlantic Fellows for Racial Equity and serves on the board of the Hazen Foundation. And Kylie Scales is the founder and principal of Think Free Global Strategies and served as the founding managing director of Black Lives Matter Global Network. I'd now like to start with a personal question to each of our speakers, uh, beginning with Amara. Amara, what does activism and being an activist mean to you in 2020? And how does activism today differ from the work earlier generations did to enact change? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me and everyone else on this panel. And thanks to your colleagues for joining today. Um, I think um, what activism means uh, is what it always has meant, which is being committed to finishing the unfinished business of America. And, its founding ideals, making sure that we are able to live up to the ideals that are stated in the Constitution and in the Declaration of Independence, but that we have fallen short of. And our continued inability to close that gap is the origin of so much suffering and injustice in our country. And so that's what I think it means to be an activist in 2020. It's funny, I, I, we had this conversation yesterday, but I, I think what's, what's um, fascinating for me is that the word activism doesn't appear anywhere in my bio, um, but it is one that people ascribe to my activities when I think that what I'm doing is exactly what I described to you, which is just um, calling out injustices and um, hopefully encouraging people to do something about them. And that's the basic work of citizenship. We should all be doing that. And so the experience that you had as a child growing up in Vermont should be, I think, everyone's um, experience. One of the things I think is different about the way in which we are approaching activism and everyone else on the panel today um, will agree to this and I think approach things in the same way is that we're very much aware of the way in which all of the subjects of injustice and marginalization in this country um, intersect and work on each other. And we are increasingly becoming aware of the reality um, of what many people like Fannie Lou Hamer and Dr. Martin Luther King said in the early 1960s, which is that if none of us, if one of us is free, none of us is free. And so I think that we are increasingly committing ourselves to supporting the justice of everyone, understanding that we can't allow there to be any fractures or fissures um, in the movement for justice. We're beyond. Um, you know, allowing ourselves to be prioritized or picked off or set upon or against each other. Um, and I think that that's what's fundamentally different about um, activism now. You can see that in the Women's March. You can see that in the basic manifesto of Black Lives Matter. You can see that in so many different ways. And so I think it means that for your, um, for many of your, your clients and then by extension your customers, it's understanding the way in which you have to have a holistic approach to social justice um, and understand that people care about so many different aspects at the same time. 
Thank you so much. Uh, Rashad, do you, do you wanna jump in here? Oh, I think you're on mute. There we go. Hello, All everyone. Right. Thank you for having me. Um, and um, I never want to follow Mara. So um, I, first of all, second what she said. And then, um, and after that, um, I think the sort of, the thing I'll say about, particularly about this moment and about, um, is that I think activism is a way for people to make sense of what's happening in the world. Um, a way for people to take um, this really, um, complicated moment we are in where we are um, seeing a lot more screens than we normally do and not enough people. Where we um, are sort of um, the, the number of kind of individuals we are connected to has been limited because of this, um, especially if you're not an essential worker. And so there's so many ways in which um, this context, this environment and what we're constantly being hit with. And in many ways, that's what animates what I do at Color of Change is to help people make sense of what's happening in the world and give people strategic things they can do uh, to take action. And I think of activism as a pipeline. It's a thing that in some ways, when you're feeling like there's nothing you can do or the world is closing in, that you can take action and you can take action with other people. And that action can help you feel powerful in ways um, that um, I think can be both fulfilling personally, but often absolutely fulfilling to the world around you. And so, you know, in some ways, activism can get a bad name and it gets a bad name because oftentimes activists have to go up against powerful forces, entrenched forces, forces for change. But the thing I want to ask everyone here is to close your eyes for a second and think about 20 years from now and think about the movie of this moment right now and ask yourself what character you wanna be in that movie. What archetype, who do you wanna be in the movie of right now, 20 years from now? You can open your eyes and you can think about who you wanna be 20 years from now is who you are right now. And whatever you're doing right now is who you will be 20 years from now and how the story will be written and how the story will be told, the archetype of who you will be. And we have an opportunity right now to write our own stories. And that is what activism is about. Shad, thank you so much. And there's some points I'd like to circle back in a second. But before we do that, Kylie, do you, do you want to share a little bit as well? Sure. Yes. Very hard acts to follow. <laughs> um, and thank you so much for having me. Um, and really conducting this very important conversation. I'm sure um, everyone will get a lot out of the, these next, this next hour. Um, what I'd love to add to what my brilliant colleagues have already said um, is that what's different, I think, in this moment, particularly after um, this past summer, where as a world, we were all brought to our knees having to witness um, uh, the brutal murder in a cavalier way um, of, of someone um, that we felt connected to, um, particularly at the time where he called out to the spirit of his dead mother. And I think that that stirred something in everyone. And activism, this, this, this sort of veil between activism and everyone lowered. And suddenly everyone felt motivated to promote or to um, enact change and were galvanized. And we saw that when folks were out in the street. So now when we say activists, activists are to the right of you and to the left of you. Activists are within our, uh, in every sector, are, are within every single genre. And so we have to think about how we, as Rashad just so eloquently stated, how we are um, showing up in this moment. And we have to give voice to the pain that we just experienced. We have to give moment to heal through what we're experiencing so that we can create um, an unencumbered solution moving forward, at each of us. So I think activism has, again, um, we've bridged this gap and everyone feels the need, hopefully, to be galvanized forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And I mean, all, all three uh, incredible ways to view it. And Rashad, like I said, I'd like to go back to a point you made and how activism has been viewed within a negative light or painted with a negative brush. And so, you know, if you're explaining to folks about color of change and your work with large companies, what would you want corporate leaders to know and to understand about your work and, and goals and objectives? And then, and then Kylie and Amara, similar with, with your organizations as well. I mean, for big companies, 
I feel like I'm trying to help them be the protagonists in the story. I'm trying to help them do the things that allow them to be the protagonists in the story. And that means structural change. Um, you know, um, one of the things that we've launched coming out of this um, moment where so many companies have spoken up and said Black Lives Matter, a lot of that is because of the voices of staff. A lot of it is because of the leadership of at the very top of the company. A lot of that is because of the demands from consumers. But regardless, these companies have made these statements. And so we've launched something called Beyond the Statement, which is really about translating the words into action the caring and the sentiment into very clear things companies can do. And, you know, there has never been a moment of social change for Black people. There's never been a social moment of social change for any group of attacked, targeted, and marginalized groups of people that hasn't involved uh, um, uncomfort, that hasn't involved pushing and challenging, that hasn't involved... Um, forces um, on the outside pushing on forces on the inside. And so we're never afraid for them. But I oftentimes most appreciate when we have the partners on the inside that are willing to take the steps to recognize that we're not asking for charity or demanding justice, that charitable uh, solutions to structural problems will not do because um, the problems that we are facing are not unfortunate like a car accident. They are unjust. They didn't just happen. They've been manufactured through a set of choices. That the, um, the ways in which society has been engineered is the way in which uh, the results have played themselves out. And so, you know, whether it is through campaigns that may feel very direct around a moment or whether it's the inside work of working with companies, um, the way in which we have done with civil rights audits, the way in which we've done through partnerships, for me, all of it is getting to a moment where we actually get to structural change that we can look look at and say that things got better. And, um, and that is hard work and it's work that's uncomfortable, but it's also the type of work that if we're gonna truly be invested in this moment, if we're truly um, going to um, um, put our energy towards something and our time towards something, then we should put it towards something that's meaningful. <clears throat> And, and I agree with that. Um, I think that there, you'll find that there are many activists um, and many organizers and many organizations in this space that are very much, um, not just willing, but very interested in working and connecting with other institutions and organizations to really create the structural change that is really necessary and needed. Um, you know, I myself, I've been in this world for um, 20 years. I've worked with organizations all over the world um, for 20 years, really trying to forward social justice needs. And one of the things that I noticed that is really necessary is an opportunity to really understand and have a deep understanding and a deep connection for people and what they really, really need and what they really require. Um, and so, and really ensuring that the goals that the organization or the institution or the corporation are thinking through are consistent with what is necessary. Um, and a lot of us have been doing this work for a long time. A lot of us have been waiting for this moment. I just remember a time over the summer thinking, Finally, you know, um, finally there was a moment where there was this mass awakening and awareness that change needed to happen and that there were people at the table that were willing to make these changes and that were willing to put pen to paper. And these are things that we've been working towards for many, 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 many years, as I said. And so I think that what is necessary in this moment to connect more um, deliberately is to really have this a deep understanding of what is necessary on the ground and myself. And this is part of why I founded Think3 Global Strategy is really thinking through some of these ideas, utilizing all of those years of experience to create these connection points. And then everyone else on, on this panel also has many, many, many resources to offer. Yeah. Um, I think for me and my work, um, that one of the key things that I think is essential for creating um, full racial justice is the inclusion of um, trans non-binary and um, black people in the narrative. Um, for too long, we have been excluded from, pushed to the side of movements that we have helped to build. And I think that one of the things that's really important is that so much of who we think is important and who we should listen to and who we should hire and who we should promote and who we should be selling to is actually who we think is important. 
And importance is oftentimes driven by the stories that we tell ourselves about who people are and who people and who's important. And so a key part of my work is shifting fundamental understandings of who um, trans people, specifically trans people of color are, why we are important, how we fit into this moment, how we fit into the larger American story and why we should be a priority both in terms of racial justice, but in terms of justice and inclusion across the board. I don't believe that we're going to be able to actually be a fully inclusive society until we do that. And so that's a huge part of my work is, um, is creating consciousness and creating um, the ability to be able to see everybody as human beings. And I think that that's just as much as important as anything. Um, um, and I think that we are making progress in that area, but there's a long way to go. Um, and if you think about anything that you do, it starts with whatever story you're telling yourself. And so it's essential that we begin to broaden who we think is important, why they're important, and the response that we should have to that. And that's what I, a lot of what my work focuses on um, at Translash um, and, and why I do what I do. Amar, I'd, I'd actually love, love to pick up on that thread. You talked a lot about inclusion, especially for, for tran trans folks and black trans in particular. You know, for, for a lot of the folks on the call today coming from a corporate background, they may be in charge or playing a huge part in DEI efforts. What does inclusion mean for the trans community? And are there, are there examples of, of, of companies or ways that, that people are, are doing this in, in the right way or, or good first steps that they can take? Yeah, I think um, inclusion for trans people means inclusion, what inclusion means for everybody. It's just that there hasn't been a focus on the inclusion of trans people for a variety of, of reasons that we could get into or, or which may be extremely obvious to so many people. Um, and I think that inclusion for trans people looks like what it looks like for everyone else. Um, it, who are you hiring? Who are you promoting? Who are you retaining? Um, who are you thinking about when you are developing new products? How are you, what's your workplace environment like? Who are your vendors? Who do you give charitable contributions to? It's the basic infrastructure of operations um, at any company or organization. It's folding um, trans people and specifically black trans people into um, that mix and into that fold. And I think that um, because, um, in any way that you look at it, overwhelmingly um, black trans people are the most marginalized of the marginalized. A lot of times that's because so many things in our society are not working and are failing. And that's why I said that until you see that situation change, you will know that our country hasn't made um, as much progress as it needs to in order to be who we say that we are on paper. And I would also argue that I think it's essential um, and to include trans people specifically at this particular moment in time, because so many of the things that companies need and organizations need in terms of um, the ability to think creatively and innovatively, the ability to be resilient, the ability to be able to think beyond binaries, um, the ability to be able to um, adapt are all things that trans people have had to include in our experience. And so if you don't actually have trans people within your organization, you're actually at an organizational deficit, particularly at a time of disruption where you need people like that on the inside. And so I think that there's so many arguments and reasons why um, why we are important. And I think that uh, because we are left out of so many stories um, and are often stereotyped that there's just, you know, beyond ignorance, it's, a, it's, it's ignoring um, an entire group of people that I think um, are essential. That's great. Rashad, you know, part of Color of Change's work is, is setting up those public benchmarks and looking to hold companies accountable for meeting them. What are some of the ways that you incorporate the, the principles and values that Amara just spoke about? And, but then what are also some of those, those metrics you're, you're looking at as, as a real concrete measurement? Yeah, if you don't track it and you don't make it transparent, it's not real. It's like a tree falling in a forest. Um, it's a hope and a dream without a, a plan and um, a strategy document. The diversity departments at most corporations are basically 
oftentimes, um, and I get invited in by a lot of diversity departments. So I'm, I shout out and love to people who are doing this work. There's a lot of people who are my friends who do this work, but it is oftentimes the one place where you can fail to meet goals or make progress year over year and nothing changes. It's the place where the CEO's compensation is not tied to results. Um, there's no bonus structure for meeting goals there, which is always the thing when something is not serious, right? I didn't get, um, I didn't get grades for our student government. And so it didn't matter. My graduation um, didn't matter on student government. And so like to the extent that you treat it like extracurricular, it will become extracurricular. And some people will participate and other people won't. Other people will tap into the other things that are extracurricular inside of your corporation and they'll opt out of the diversity thing, which doesn't feel like it's tied to goals, metrics, or your go-to-market strategy. So part of what we've done at, at um, Beyond the Statement and also our work at Change Hollywood and what we're going to be launching soon at Change Music is very clear roadmaps for what companies can do. And Change Hollywood, we've partnered with Michael B. Jordan to actually go to um, each of the major studios and production companies around inclusion riders, around diversity trainings, around a whole set of things where folks will publish their numbers and we'll be able to look at numbers year over year. This is how we start getting to making the caring turn into action. Um, and then, you know, um, I hope we can talk more about what the individuals can do later, but I do think that sort of in this sort of structural change, that also is going to require money and resources to put behind it. And if you think that you can upend sort of a, a stream that has been going in one direction, if you can upend cultural norms that have, you know, kept trans women, trans women of color out, upend norms that have um, kept uh, black folks out that have made it so that um, black people have to have uh, two more degrees to get to the same level as a white person does. Like if you up in those, if you think you can up in those norms simply by caring and not by a strategy plan that holds people accountable, you should only look at how far you get on anything that you get to that you care about without actually um, structures, goals, and most importantly, accountability. That's such a great point. And, and actually, I'd love to, you know, you picked up on that thread right on what can individuals do. Kylie, I don't know if you want to kick us off on that, yeah. on that discussion on how folks at the company, whether they're in DEI departments or, or just are eager and want to help promote that change, what can folks do to help influence this uh, at their companies and at their organizations? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I've had um, lots of conversations, as I'm sure everyone else on the panel has, with individuals within corporations that are feeling this moment very acutely. Individuals who have sat in these seats um, for years and have worked hard and as Rashad eloquently stated, have you know, oftentimes been um, secondary to, to, to more primary goals. And this felt different to them. Um, and we would have conversations where people would be very emotional about the fact that all of a sudden now people are really going, speaking, asking questions, really wanting to hear um, more about solutions, really focusing um, on this moment um, and really trying to figure out what their company is doing and, you know, really paying attention. And so, you know, and I urged everyone to, number one, not allow this moment to pass by because many people were coming with mixed feelings. Many people were like, we've been doing this forever and nobody's been paying attention now all of a sudden. In another, in, in another way, people were just like, this is very exciting. I'm so excited that people are finally paying attention. But then they noticed that it started to wane, right? Enthusiasm started to wane, less people were, were volunteering, less people were engaged. And so folks were trying to really figure out how to make all of this stick. So number one, I would say, you know, don't allow of this moment to pass by. I feel like there's a window. We all can see this window is open. We have to take this opportunity to kick down the entire door and ask for all of the things that we've always wanted um, and all of the things that we've needed to take real effort, to take comprehensive overview of what's going on internally and really ensure that people pay attention internally first 
and then trickle outwards and make sure that your community is connected um, to the work that you're doing and ensure and demand that your organization, when they're making pronouncements, when they are um, hashtagging, when they are doing all these things, also make sure that they are paying attention to the organizations and local um, institutions that you yourself support inside of your company and make sure that there's funding and um, attention paid to that. Um, some, this, this came up yesterday and, and Amara had this brilliant point, which I will attribute to her. And it was um, organize, 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 and make sure that what you're doing internally has structure, has, as Rashad was saying, has process, has goals, has timelining. Ensure that when you are knocking on those doors and having these conversations and really compelling and, and carrying the spirit of, of change and organizing and activism forward, that you do it in an organized way. This is not a game. This is very serious. There are people who've been doing this for many, many years, and there are strategies and things that we all must think about when we are trying to achieve our overall goal. We are trying to achieve that North Star. So attention really must be paid to ensuring that we are set up to achieve our goals. So spend time, spend energy, process, bring in convenior groups, make sure that you stay very, very organized in order to achieve your goals. Amara, I can see you nodding your head up and down. So if you want to jump in, and I see Rashad taking notes too. So we'll give you a chance to Rashad on this. Yeah, two things. So my the the organized, organized, organized point um, that um, that Kelly just referenced um, for me is very simple. It is about finding people who believe the same thing that you do, who see the issues the same way that you do, and working with them to come up with a plan for change and to involve other people in your organization who see things the same way and who want to make a change. It's really, it's that's at the core of it. Um, and I also think um, that um, we can never underestimate the power of the question. You know, and what I mean by that is that your ability to ask your leadership, your colleagues, um, why aren't certain things happening? Why aren't certain people in the room? What are the things that we can be doing to um, support efforts or people more, I think are really, really essential. Um, I think that we often can get paralyzed because things can look so big, but all of us have the ability, especially inside these organizations to ask questions. And you will be, I have been surprised a lot of times that the power of the question um, can be a catalyzing force to drawing other people in and to all of the processes that, um, that we were just um, discussing. So those are the two points that I, I want to make. Now I'm gonna hear Rashad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I first of all, I wanna appreciate both of what my colleagues have said. Um, the thing I will add for folks who are watching um, is oftentimes we don't say what we mean, or maybe we do say what we mean and we mean the wrong thing. Um, and I want to I want to give us some tools to even how we talk about inequality. We will oftentimes say black people are less likely to get loans from the bank instead of banks are less likely to give loans to black people. We will say uh, black women are less likely to get hired in C-suite jobs instead of C-suite jobs at this corporation excludes black women or this corporation excludes black women from C-suite jobs. Why is that important? That is important because on one hand, we get financial literacy programs to help black people do better inside of corporations, which from their very beginning or banks from their beginning have excluded. We get pipeline and mentorship programs for black women that actually then don't deal with the maybe racism or misogyny inside the structure, which have prevented people from actually succeeding. The thing is, is that we've gotten very comfortable talking about the systems and passive voice and the people in active voice. And then what it does is it makes us spend our time fixing people. It makes us ask the question, what's wrong with black people? Oh, black people need extra help to succeed here. Not what's wrong with our structure, which um, this population of people that despite all of these barriers standing in their way have succeeded, can't actually make it here. We will say black, we will say black people, we will talk about black communities and we will say vulnerable communities. Vulnerability is a personal trait. Now, I may personally be vulnerable if I like go on social media and see an ex that's way too happy with his life. I'm like, that's me being vulnerable. And I need to work on that on myself. 
That is not what a community is. Black communities have been targeted, attacked, exploited. Let's not spend our time fixing Black communities and Black people. Let's fix, spend our time fixing the systems. And that goes for both what happens inside the company, but also how you sort of think about how your work impacts the outside world. If we start from the right place, then we don't end up with charitable solutions to problems that are actually structural. Because what ends up happening with charitable solutions to structural problems is that the, is that the actual problem never goes away. And we spend our time worrying about why these people can't actually fix their problem when in fact the problem is one that has been manufactured, um, a problem where people are benefiting from it. And so there is opportunity if we truly want to win in this moment. And by winning, I mean all of us. Winning into a, a world where more of us have equity, opportunity, and it happens at the intersectional level so that we remove barriers that stand in the way. But in order to do that, we have to actually start by saying what we mean and diagnosing the problem the right way and not allowing the systems uh, off the hook um, and putting the people who are um, experiencing these systems um, as the sort of sole uh, uh, vehicle to solving it. All, all fantastic. I think this is, these are all great tips. So we've got folks on this call. Let's say they said, this is great, Rashad. Kylie, Amara, I need to call you up and, and get your advice. And how, how can we engage and how can you work with my company? Kylie, maybe starting with you, if somebody contacts you, what's the information and the data they need to bring to that conversation in order to really have a meaningful dialogue and start talking about some of these structural changes uh, we're discussing here? Yeah, absolutely. And it can feel really big, right? It can feel really, really, really big to, to think about how we can approach a structural solution. Um, and I see this replicate all over the world. This is, this is an issue for communities all over the world that we need to address and serve. And I think that the first thing that we need to do is to think about what we are able to, as how, how a company is able to position its priorities and its, um, its desire to, to, to create change, how, how it aligns with the organizations that they're looking to serve. And I think that one of the first things um, um, that we need to think about as companies is really um, committing to a meaningful collaboration. Uh, oftentimes I've seen companies who either do the perfunctory collaboration or the obtuse collaboration and like nothing in between. It's just very confusing for people to understand what the right entry point is. So I, I always recommend that people spend time and I've seen companies do this very, very well, spend time really thinking about the pain points within the organization, what your, what, what your appetite is, um, what your resources are, and who sits at the table. And as uh, my colleagues have said, making sure that the people who sit at the table are diverse to contribute these ideas and suggestions and solutions, and come up with a framework that is necessary that, you, that one can then choose then the right organization or the right organizations that, they, that can help forward some of those ideals and some of those goals. And then, of course, there's this other element of um, tracking and transparency, which I've heard as mentioned on this uh, conversation as well, and just ensuring that all those people pieces come together. Because what I noticed, as I'm sure many have, is the summer sort of created this moment inside of people where they felt like I have to do something and I have to do something right now. And I have to find people and then I have to make sure that those people feel supported. But then what happens is, is that our colleagues and our constituents and our consumers are like, well, where's the demonstrable change? Like, where's the change? And then, you know, those same institutions look to the organizations they support and said, well, now what? What are we doing? And I think that we really need to understand that a lot of these organizations and folks on the ground are, have been doing this work for a very, very, very long time with or without support and are fully entrenched. And so as corporations, we really need to think about, or corporations really need to think about, and other types of organizations really need to think about the framework in which we can engage in a very, very meaningful way. And, you know, we, we can all be contacted and, or, and all of the folks on this call can help really think through that. Amara, do you want to go next? Um, sure. I, I mean, for me, um, and Rashad's the master, so I'm excited to, to hear all the points that are going to follow me. For me, um, the most important thing that corporations can do is actually know what you want before you pick up the phone. Um, and what I mean by that is that 
I think that so many times corporations can approach issues around activism and racial justice um, in a transactional way. What do I mean by that? Uh, there's a specific um, ERG that wants you to do something in particular, or your customers are demanding you to do this one thing to, do, to make a, a change. And so what you'll do in those circumstances, or too many people do, is to come and say, all right, I've got this one thing that I need to fix with this one group of people. What can I do to do that and move on? And I think that um, we have to think about social justice and social change and the response to these pressures, not as transactional, but actually as relational and holistic. And so it really is, instead of thinking about how do I fix this one problem, what as a corporation are we willing to do to try to, to change and to be better? And I think that if you have answered that question about what the willingness structure is inside of your organization, then it makes the conversations or the ability for um, me or anybody else on this panel to influence and to guide much more effective and I think will address the heart of the matter. Because we're actually beyond an age in which um, people and populations that care about social justice are interested in transactional politics or transactional arrangements. As a matter of fact, you can see some, some of those often come um, under criticism where people will say, oh, this corporation or this group is coming under pressure from this community and they're responding by doing this one thing and moving on. It's much more about thinking about these things, um, again, in a relational way and what inside your organization are you willing to do? And so that means having some conversations um, about that before reaching out. I think we're beyond kind of a phase of transactional um, solutions to specific social justice problems and pressures. And I think that that's one of the things that people have to realize about what's different now. Well, excellent. Well, Amara, like you said, we, we saved Rashad the best for, for last to, to close us out here on this topic. Great, so, you know, um, that, that was all great. Um, uh, one thing that I, and I wanna just add to it because so much was said about sort of the approach um, and the structures. A couple of things I wanna add here is, is that one, is that it's hard to fully engage with anyone or any community if you see them from a deficit perspective. So mm -hmm. while so much of what we see in the media space, so much of what we see particularly now is about black pain from COVID to the uprisings, we have to center black joy, which is not the absence of pain, but the presence of aspiration. If you are only reaching out because you see from a deficit perspective, then you miss the point that in an election cycle, it's not about like, will black people vote or not, but it's about black people being the protagonists in the American story of voting. No group of people have stood on longer lines, face more dignities, face more threats in order to express our will for a better future. And that is what a protagonist is. It is uh, a group of people or a person that has overcome barriers in order to still win despite it. And if we think about, if you think about what does it mean um, to engage uh, black trans women, recognize that they are the protagonists in the story of being one fully human, fully oneself, fully a citizen, fully out, fully um, visible in a society that at every turn um, has told them not to be or has put up barriers to their full participation. We have to approach people as protagonists because that can unlock the potential for all the barriers to actually be removed. Think about yourself as part of removing those barriers and that can unlock so much potential for what's possible. You know, one thing that I love is that when I end up with a corporation and I'm not running a campaign. But the second thing I love is that when I run a campaign on a corporation or I'm in a campaign on a corporation and they actually want to be inside of a conversation because they recognize the fact that it works and it's complicated. You know, when I first got to Color of Change, there would be this way in which I would watch as um, the different door would be open for black folks um, uh, than was open when I was at GLAD. Like we would, I would like stay in the room and I'm like, I know there's a diff another door. And um, like, no, that's all we have. And I'm like, oh no, no, no. The white gay group got a lot more. And, um, and I say that to say that um, 
we do um, have to think about um, how we've approached these relationships, how we've approached these situations. And, you know, part of what we've had to do at Color of Change is make people nervous about disappointing us. And that can sometimes mean that folks feel uncomfortable or folks feel uncomfortable about the ways in which we engage. But recognize that over 7 million people have taken action with us in the last eight months. And so what we recognize, what we represent is not just the voice of people that have taken action with us, but a growing voice of people that want to be engaged, Black folks and allies of every race at the intersection of every experience that want something better, that don't just don't want to care, but want to act. That is a business opportunity. That is a go-to-market strategy to be on the right side of what's happening now and what the right side to come. I see that someone asked in the chat about Beyond the Statement. I think it's beyondthestatement.org. Um, and then there's changehollywood.org. Um, and I think you can also get to those sites off of the Color of Change main page, but sometimes they keep me out of some of those decisions because um, I make the wrong decisions as you can imagine any, anybody who's a, a, little, a little away from the data can make. But all of this is an opportunity for corporations to approach us the right way. And at Color of Change, we have teams of people that work on what does it mean to develop meaningful strategic partnerships? What does it mean to get corporations um, to be engaged in civil rights audits where we actually sort of look at the policies and practices and we have we recommend folks that can sort of engage in those audits that are sort of outside uh, folks. Um, and then what does it mean as you're thinking about your advertising? What does it mean as you're thinking about, um, you know, your larger um, sort of go-to-market strategies of how you're engaging the community? This is all things um, that we think about very clearly. Um, and as an organization, and I guess the final thing I'll just say from us, as an organization, we don't take corporate financial support. And, um, and it has been you know, an interesting road building an organization uh, where you don't take corporate financial support. Uh, my last organization did and, um, or does. And, um, and the thing I will say about it is, is that we're never gonna come and ask for a check as part of this work. We're gonna ask for as much justice and freedom as possible. And that's not to say groups that do take checks are asking for it, but I'm just saying in terms of asking about how you approach us. Um, Cause I oftentimes end up midway through the conversation of like, oh, we could sponsor that. What we want is to sponsor more justice. And that's gonna be the bottom line in any conversation. And that's the opportunity also uh, from corporations that have partnered with us for you to tell your staff, for the staff that are speaking up and raising that we actually partnered with a group that is gonna hold us accountable at every single turn to what we said we were gonna do. And that, be that means that we are deeply serious about the work of actually building justice. Can I just say one thing um, to add to what Rashad said? And I think this is a really important point. It's um, this idea, we even started here that people can fear, um, can fear activist or social justice organizations. But I think that that fear is misplaced. I think that the fear is misplaced because those activists and organizations are not separate from you or your organization or your entity. They are your organization and your ent entity. I have a friend of mine who um, works uh, in marketing at um, a, a technology company and was trying to convince um, her technology company to become more involved in racial justice. And um, the person who leads their company wasn't getting it. And she said, what you don't get is that the people on the streets right now for Black Lives Matter are, are me and they are your customers, right? There is no, there is not this separation. And what's happening is that the band is moving in the opposite direction of the person who's leading it. And so what we actually need to do is to not look at this as being oppositional, but we actually need to catch up to remain relevant. And I think that that's a really important point that, you know, there's not this division. The people that are assigning color of change petitions and participating the 7 million aren't 7 million people on another planet <laughs> or another country, right? They're here and they're everywhere. And um, that it's just a really important point for people, I think, to, to, to grasp. Yeah, that's a great point. And Amar, maybe I'll, I'll start with you with this one final question before we go to, to our audience questions. You know, 
we've, we've talked about this over and over in, the, in this conversation about how these structural changes are needed to dismantle the systematic inequality. And, yeah. and now's, now's the time to put in that hard work and that dedication. Do, do you view that that enthusiasm is there uh, all the way you know, from corporate leadership on down? Is it a bottom up or are you hopeful about, about change? A change comes in waves. And so I am hopeful in this wave, understanding that all, all moments, all openings, all, all energies have a limited time span, right? And I think that that's why you've heard um, people say on this panel, everyone, that this is a, a door that we have to walk through in this particular moment. Um, so in this moment, yes, I am hopeful. And I think that it's because of this realization this un growing understanding that the people that are demanding change are not in opposition to you. They're not people that are apart from what you're doing. It's your customers, it's your employees. If you are leading um, a corporation, it can be your spouse, it can be your children, right? That this call is, 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 has power because of its broad universality. I think there, um, there were 4,400 Black Lives Matters protests um, across um, cities and towns across the country in 4,400 different locations in the country over the summer. That's, that's, a, that's a different type of a thing. And it means again, that as corporations, as organizations, that the way in which you respond is really right now a game of catch up and not mitigating what's happening. It's really catching up to what's happening and changing so that you can remain relevant as, a, as an organization in this moment. And I think that that's what everyone on this panel is saying that, you know, needs to happen and there are varying ways in which uh, we can support in that. Rashad, how about you? You know, I mean, I think, I think we are in a, in a moment of a tremendous opportunity. And I just want to, in some ways, second what, what my colleagues um, have said. And I think that, you know, I want to, I started off by asking people to sort of close their eyes and imagine who they would be in this moment. And, and I hope that, um, you know, through this conversation, you're finding ways um, to start leaning into, into that possibility. Um, yeah. This is um, an opportunity of deep uh, cultural change um, in our country and our society. And at the same time, we can't mistake presence for power, presence being visibility, awareness, retweet, shout outs from the stage, for the ability to actually change the rules. And changing the rules has to be the standard by which we look at how change actually happens. And folks in corporate America, folks um, in the political space have so much opportunity to be either uh, forces for good or barriers to the change that um, is necessary. And, and I think all of us um, have an opportunity to pick um, and choose uh, you know, where it is we're gonna, where it is we're gonna land. Kylie. Thank you. <laughs> um, I really do think I'm approaching this time very optimistically. Um, and I say that because of many of the conversations that I've had and the people um, that I've been working with, I see them coming large and small. I see very large organizations and corporations thinking about how they can enact change. I see startups um, and other and, and NGOs and other types of organizations really thinking about um, their intervention. And we really just, at, in this moment, I see every, people really thinking about um, and I encourage people to continue to think about really what your intervention is in this moment. What can you as an individual, as an institution, how you can impact the system, what can you do in this moment to really enact the, the, um, the change that is required to transform the world and to galvanize us forward? And I mm -hmm. see that happening in many ways. I see people, in addition to making statements, I, I work, I'm working with people on writing, uh, really, really fine tuning what their intention is and really calling the right people and bringing the right people to the table. I see uh, a strong desire to um, change what's happening internally. I hear a lot about people who are um, hearing what their colleagues are saying and wanting to promote space for healing and conversation. Um, I hear large businesses, large organizations, large corporations thinking more strategically about how to be inclusive in their messaging and how to really reach the individuals and the communities that they want to reach from their vantage point and really thinking through at all levels. They're, they're in order for us to galvanize forward, in order for us to 
enable and enact and have this change where root take flight, whatever we want to say in this moment, we have to think about how intervention looks at every single level. So I, I feel inspired by what I'm seeing people doing and how they're delivering and how they're thinking and how they're strategizing in this moment. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, well, like I said, uh, we've had some folks submit questions uh, in advance and also adding to our chat box. So uh, one of those questions is, how closely should actions taken by a company in the name of social justice track a company's mission or focus or a CEO's personal mission or focus? If your work is um, in a certain sector, I absolutely think you should deal with um, what's happening in that sector. My, uh, my uh, grandmother used to always say, help begins at home. And, um, and I think that like, you have to start at where you're at, both in the communities that you um, impact and that you're located in, um, as well as the sort of ways in which you impact, um, impact folks. You know, um, we've been dealing over the last couple of years with folks that sort of profit off of inequality, you know, whether it's mass incarceration or other systems. And, um, and, and that's a real, that can be a small bubble, but there's a much larger bubble of companies that in some way, um, you know, will send water bottles for Flint, but might not have been on the right side of the lobbying around whether or not that company gets clean pipes. Um, and so I do think that matching uh, what you say publicly, matching uh, your go-to-market strategy with how you actually um, engage in the world is going to be incredibly important. And I think that that's going to be the work of the future. I think increasingly people are looking for brands that have alignment between what they say and where they engage and how they show up. And, you know, this is an opportunity not just to be fearful about the pitfalls. This is an opportunity to think about what does it mean to win? Because the winners will be the institutions that figure this out and do it well. And so approaching this from the perspective of I want to win on this, not of I don't want to get into trouble, is a way to really think about how do you expand what's possible, not simply entrench in the face of changing dynamics, demographics, and culture. Yeah, and I, I just want to build on that. It's an incredibly important point um, because I've noticed that people are almost apprehensive, you know, in many cases about saying too much or getting engaged and, and really winning, as Rashad said, because they're afraid of what might be kicked up in this cancel culture and what mm -hmm. might have happened in the past. And I think that um, it is important to think about, you know, your intention. I always lead back to intention. Like, what is it that you are, how are you trying to, 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 to succeed? How are you trying to address these issues? And be open to the fact that there will be some challenges, that things are not very easy. This is an entrepreneurial time. We have to think about how what to, what to try and how to fail fast. And, and in this moment, if we are hesitant because we are risk averse, we'll miss the opportunity and we won't be on the right side of history. So I think it's very important to really ground in what, the, what your intention is as an institution and really who you want to be and how you want it to, to, to define and be very transparent about that so that your, your consumers, so that your constituents are, and, so, and your internal colleagues are able to really understand where you're coming from and how that this, this is an authentic opportunity and an authentic collabora collaboration as opposed to just kind of paying lip service and just trying to be a part of this moment. Um, it's very important to just, you know, take a minute. We've had this moment that we all felt like we had to rush in and do the thing and throw the band-aid and throw the funds left and hither and yon. But it's also really important to take a moment and to really assess where we are, where you are as an institution and a corporation and an, uh, and an organization and really think and consider what you're able to offer and what you, and how you wanna be perceived. Um, I'm gonna take the second part of that question because my ears perked up um, in my time at Viacom. I know this very well when um, a CEO or an organizational leader has um, a social justice issue that they care about or a charity that they care about, it's suddenly, there's suddenly desire to make that the thing that the entire corporation does. And I think that um, one of the responsibilities of people who either have that as their official portfolio inside the organization can go to that person and say, you're probably not gonna dissuade them that your company shouldn't be doing something 
on the thing that they care about. But it's also equally important to say, I understand that this is what you're doing and where you wanna go, but you should know that our employees and our customers want us to go in this direction. And we have to also do this other thing as well, in addition to the thing that you want to do. And I also think that, um, again, employee resource groups can play a really pivotal role, again, in raising that question and pressing um, people and leadership to expand their comfort zone in terms of where they give and where they spend their charitable time and what they do, um, that that's really important. Fantastic. I know we've only got a couple of minutes left. I'd, I'd like to give each of you just 30 seconds if you have any closing statements or remarks or a thought you want to leave our audience with. And Rashad, maybe I'll ask you to start and then we'll go to Kylie and Amara. Yeah, I mean, first of all, thank you for the opportunity. It's also a, a pleasure to be on a panel with Kaylee and Amara. Um, and I hope that you check out their work and support it, um, engage in it. Um, and I hope that you um, check out Color of Change and figure out ways in which we um, can engage and partner and, um, and ways in which we can do the work to change the rules. Awesome, Kylie? Uh, thanks again, thank you for um, this opportunity to have this really, really, really important conversation. I've learned so much just from listening to the panelists. Um, I hope, I, I know that every participant has also learned a lot from everything that we've heard and what we've said. Um, and again, I just encourage everyone to really think through what their internal plans are, um, to really think about where they want to sit and, you know, feel free to reach out. Um, uh, you can see me and my work at KylieScales.com and of course there's BlackLivesMatter.com um, and um, multiple multiple other organizations in the space that are doing great work. Yeah, I think the um, last thing that I would say just to um, um, build upon what we've been talking about is that we're not gonna be able to build a just society without the participation and the help of corporations in the private sector. It's just not gonna happen. Um, we can see that there are pivotal swings in public opinion and even in laws when corporations mobilize behind change. Marriage equality is one of the ones that springs um, to, to my mind really easily. The same thing with the Supreme Court case, um, which ruled that you can't discriminate against trans people just because they're trans, um, which was before the court last year. And um, just the array of companies and corporations that put pressure on the court and said, we want to um, have this law, we want to have civil rights laws apply to everybody is key. And so what that means is that you have a really important role to play in the way that social justice unfolds in this country. And that given the fact that you're inside of places or starting up places or consulting with places that are really powerful and moving that you also have not only an opportunity but a responsibility to help us get there. And I think that that is the thing that can't be lost is that everyone has a really important role to play right now. And it's really important um, for us to figure out how um, we do that. You know, we're gonna echo Rashad's grandma that help begins at home. Well, on that, on that point, Amara, Rashad, Kylie, thank you so much for joining us and everyone in the audience. Uh, thank you for joining for this sixth panel discussion of invariance. Dialogue for Change. Uh, please be on a lookout for follow-up emails from Invariant with more details about this series and for additional anti-racism resources. Uh, you can also find us on Twitter at Invariant and on LinkedIn. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.